Frozen in a moment of time, the team finds itself trapped in the illusionary mental hospital created by the yellow-eyed devil. If only there was someone else frozen that might be able to lend a hand. It's the FX original series, Legion, Chapter 6. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of Legion. So, the mind of spoilers dwells ahead. <laughs> Alright, great. Uh, so, oh, what an episode this week. Really, I mean, we are diving into the mental stuff here, but now it was just sort of a fun game of, of kind of cat and mouse between uh, Lenny and really Sid in this episode. Uh, most of these episodes, of course, we're focusing on David. He's the central character. This episode takes a small shift and really we are focusing a lot more on Sid and her experience. Um, and it sort of, and it makes sense because while everybody else seems to be kind of falling in line in this illusionary world that Lenny has created, Sid is the one that keeps questioning, who is noticing small differences. So it's through her that we start to see the breaks uh, and everything and start to sort of mess with the, the, the realities that Lenny has created to try and trap everyone in. Um, now, of course, we're starting off with, and I thought really well done, uh, Lenny as the doctor, sort of interviewing everyone, going through everyone's counseling sessions. Um, and there's really just the repetitive message here from Lenny is that everybody is wrong. Everybody is messed up. Everybody is unhealthy. Every act that they are doing, Melanie holding on to her husband, no, that's just an illusion. Uh, he is dead. The two carries together, no, you're not the same person. Of course not. This is unhealthy. Your relationship next to each other. Autonomy's ability to go back into memories. As a time traveler, I thought that was a very cool statement. Um, but all that is wrong. That is unhealthy. Um, so Lenny really working to minimize everyone's thoughts, beliefs, make them doubt who they really are. Uh, but there are breaks in this illusion, and Sid starts to, well, they really start to notice around Sydney. I love her line of saying that this, everything feels like a dream, but not an interesting one, like you're folding laundry. Uh, and that's a lot how it is. And at that moment, we start to see some of these little breaks. Uh, specifically, when she's saying that, Lenny is behind her pouring a glass of water, no sound. Then as she goes back in to get her meds, who of course is dismissed as soon as she starts thinking about these wider thoughts, um, she's dismissed to go get her meds, and as she's standing there, as we're panning around the room, we've got Carrie and Carrie playing ping pong without a ball, but there is sound. And as it pans away and she gets her med and it pans back, then the ball is there. So we're having these these small inconsistencies in reality uh, that are sort of giving the, the hints that something isn't quite right. Uh, and then, of course, we have the door that she runs into um, that she is constantly being pulled away from. We know that this is significant, one, because it appears and disappears. Um, also, there seems to be a sound, and it is a different door than anyone else in the hospital. It's a wood door. It's a very natural-looking door. Uh, and I think we can assume that this is the escape. This is the way out. This is the break into David's mind. And, and we get a little hint of that later on. Um, but every time this door is brought up, she's interrupted. Uh, when Sid first finds the door, just as she's thinking and listening to it, that's when the warning on the overhead speaker saying, you have to come get your meds, this is your first warning. When she goes and talks to uh, Tonami and David and brings up the idea behind the door, she's interrupted by Lenny. Uh, and then even later on, when David himself finds the door, uh, Nurse Amy, <laughs> God, she's so creepy in this one, um, interrupts him with some very interesting clues, which, which we'll get back to in a little bit. So all of these are kind of inconsistent. They keep away, not pay attention to it. These are all the little hints uh, that Sid is getting and kind of spurs her on to constantly dig through all of these questions. 
The other kind of obvious tell that we have throughout the episode is, of course, the repetitions of scenes that we saw back in Chapter 1. Though a little bit different, uh, as David had described to Sid's questioning, it's like deja vu, but different. Uh, the first one, of course, is a Drooling Guy. Before it was David and Lenny commenting about the length of the drool and what its consistency is, here we have Tonomy and David. Uh, also, the person drooling, not the same guy as in the first episode. This, I believe, is the other teammate, uh, the one who got knocked out in the, the eye took his form, uh, which is probably why he's kind of an unconscious form, but just off to the side. Take that extra! So, we have that scene, and then, of course, we have the bedroom scene when uh, David comes in to Sid's, though in, back in Chapter 1 it was Sid coming into David's room. And there's an interesting point right there with the feet. Uh, and I know this has been kind of a discussion with the whole, it's all an illusion, everything is just in David's mind. Uh, because we have a repetition of that scene where it's also, we see, the, we see from the view underneath the bed where the door opens and then closes, then it pans up, and then in Chapter 1 that was Sid, in this one it's David. So is this person real and, or are they not? Since everything is basically illusionary and created here, I don't think you can actually trust everyone. I, I get the feeling that when Sid is interacting with people, when everybody is interacting, sometimes those are the mental projections, personas of, of the group. But sometimes it's Lenny, it's the yellow-eyed devil in that form. In the first, in the first, uh, uh, seen from this, uh, from chapter one, when Sid comes into David's room, she is telling David uh, that she's leaving and that David has to get out. He has to get out too. In this one, when David comes in, it's about staying. And I think there it is the yellow-eyed devil either pushing David in this direction or perhaps actually taking that form of David and saying, trying to convince Sid, stop trying to break out, you have to stay here. Whereas back in chapter one, when this first happened and it was Sid's form talking to David, I think that might have been the yellow-eyed devil trying to get David out of the institution. That was real, and the devil wanted him out to be able to go out and cause havoc and destruction out there in the world. Um, and I think here it was more of the push to keep uh, Sid in. So just, just a thought right there, uh, but I think, I think that's pretty close to what's happening. Now, of course, in this world, though, David does feel comfortable. I mean, so it makes sense when he was talking to, to, to Sid about wanting to stay here. Um, because this is the world created by the yellow-eyed devil. You know, this is, this is a being that he has been with, if not for most of his life, for all of his life, um, doing the mental warfare back and forth. So being in this world, separated from his body, and in some sense you could say his powers, where everything is probably suppressed and he doesn't have the same type of psychic noise uh, and such going on, where his personality and his experience can really be controlled, uh, might give a sense of comfort to a schizophrenic who is constantly unsure of what reality is. Um, so I get that that David is, is, is with, you know, that, that that's really where his position is coming from. But of course it doesn't last. Because the one thing that we do find constantly whenever there are any questions going on of that reality, it pushes back. And, and sometimes uh, it can be each other. I mean, there's that scene where David is, where, where uh, Sidney is reading the book to David and you know, looking at the possibilities, oh, of mind palaces and altered realities and dream states which is pretty much what they're in. But that's when David pushes back, and that's where I'm saying, is it David pushing, saying, hey, don't push the edges, you're making me uncomfortable, and that's where the confusion of symptoms was back and forth, or maybe that wasn't David. Again, that was Lenny, that was the yellow-eyed devil in David's form interacting with Sidney there pushing back saying, hey, you are being delusional, you aren't thinking things clearly, it doesn't make any sense. So it could go either way. I mean, and that's the one question that you have constantly, constantly throughout this episode is really who's real and who is illusionary, who is acting out of their own uh, belief system within this world and who is being 
pushed or, or uh, into certain directions, into certain mindsets to express that, to try and keep everybody uh, trapped in there and passive. Okay, by far the best scene in the entire episode is the Lenny dance through David's mind. It was just beautiful. It was dark. It was creepy. It was uncomfortable uh, and perfectly done. With that whole sequence, they said everything they needed to without using a word. That is just a beautiful use of cinema, of camera work, of visual storytelling. We see in that moment how Lenny is just traipsing through David's mind, through his memories, messing with everything, totally in control, has been there for ages, is constantly a, a constant presence throughout his life and just constantly pushing and messing with him. It was just, it was beautiful and it was dark. I mean, swinging on the extension cord that he hung himself with and just tearing everything apart. Ah, oh, it was just, it was a beautiful sequence. And of course, at the end of that, she wanders right back into the hospital out that door. And that's where I'm saying that is the door to the rest of David's mind. That is the exit point. Um, and that seems to actually have been where uh, uh, Sid was pushed into that very end when she finally gets that realization. She finds the wall and it's bleeding and she gets the memory shot back of, oh my God, that's right, this is where we were. This is what reality is. Uh, but only for a moment because when she gets that flash, again, the world pushes back and there is Lenny uh, with some headphones, which she just, a doctor carries around with them all the time, of course. Uh, for a little bit of music therapy, which is basically just a nice hypnotic repetitive trance that just puts her out and boom, and then gets her out of everybody's way. That wonderful last final moment, oh, it was, just, it was so nice. It was, this was like in that, that second reveal. We had last week, we had Carrie kind of explaining who the yellow-dyed devil is, this eternal mutant, the Shadow King, as I'll just start to call from now on as opposed to the yellow eyed devil, because that's who it is. Um, just sort of lays her plans out completely with David in that moment of just saying, you know, I've been trying to get you, I've been trying to work this all out because you're powerful and I'm powerful and together we could be like super powerful, but it's too much work. And I love the whole analogy of the fungus and the ant brain. Oh, that was perfect. I mean, he used the parasite before, but this is really much more what it is, because it is. It's a growth in the brain that takes over the personality and then suppresses whatever is there, really destroys it. Uh, and I think that's really what the Shadow King does. I think it destroys the personality. David is too strong. You can't trust anything uh, that Lenny says, that the yellow eyed devil, that Shadow King says because it's an untrustworthy source. She's saying that she could take out David anytime you want, that it was just for fun. I don't think that's the case. I think David is too powerful and it's taken this long for the Shadow King to create enough of a foothold um, in him uh, in order to kind of then suppress his personality. Because again, he wasn't killed, he wasn't taken out, he was put in a box and shoved in the corner of his brain. Again, you can't trust anything the Shadow King says. Everything is a lie. Everything is an illusion. But not to everybody, because there is an outside force that is sort of observing everyone in the form of Oliver Bird. Ah, oh, I would wait for Oliver to pop back in, and this was a perfect sign. Now, they're all trapped inside of a mind. I don't know if it's David's mind, or the other eye devil's mind, or some astral plane type of thing, but in, it's sort of a dream type of state. And in dream states, we go to the astral plane. And that's where Oliver is. So whether because everybody is trapped there and that allows him access, or because David visited him and therefore Oliver has a connection to David, so through David, he can go and access everyone else. That might be a little bit more likely right there. Um, but just wonderful. I mean, we get the first set when David, when Carrie is talking about dreaming of an ice cube. And he said, a giant ice cube, thought of Oliver. Uh, and Care, other Carrie talking about 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's the big diving suit. So 
which starts off early. Um, but when Oliver does show up, uh, first for Carrie, I thought that was beautiful. And you can really see him being pulled out of that illusion because where does he go? He goes to the forest where Carrie was doing the big fight who got wounded. And what does Carrie look like now? Beat up just after he reabsorbed Carrie and when all these situations happened up into the house right until right before he, he got pulled into, the, into clockworks there. So this is him returning back to his reality mind and then following Oliver off. Same thing then happens, of course, to, uh, uh, to Melanie as well, which was very cute and very nice. And I love the whole break through the wall. And there we get to see the return for her. The realization is that scene being able to see that last, that frozen moment where they're all in, where we've got the eye in disguise firing off the submachine gun and David and Sid, or Sid trying to cover David. Um, just like that thing, I knew that the point was to try and move the bullets to try and save. Couldn't do that, couldn't move them, uh, but did get a bit discovered. I'm not sure if discovered so much as observed because we, much like when Carrie disappears, we won't see him again uh, until the very end. When Melanie disappears, we don't see her uh, 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 and, uh, again after that also. So, and that, when those eyes popped up in the background there of looking at that whole scene, oh, that was just, that was beautifully done. Um, but this is going to, of course, be the out, because Sid gets rescued then at the very moment, not by Oliver, but Carrie in the suit, which I thought was beautiful. Um, so this is going to be their escape, where everybody else gets to get out and then go back in and finally free David from what is now a trapped coffin in his mind. All right, a couple other small things real quick. Uh, one, the eye. His name is Walter. That's good to know. Uh, and he seems to be the only one really unaffected by everything or perhaps not bothered with uh, by the Shadow King. Um, we only see him those couple of times. He's never really in the rest of the break room. He's never around with anyone else. It was just in that first discussion with Lenny and then popping up pursuing Carrie. Uh, as uh, Shadow King, as Lenny says, he is the only one that understands that it's all about power. Now, whether that is why she, he, it is letting Walter wander around and torture Carrie like that, prey upon her, or um, if because, because Walter, because the eye has those mental illusions, has those diving in, has that kind of strange power that he's not as subjected to uh, the Shadow King's influence as much as everyone else. Not entirely sure there, but certainly the Shadow King uh, appreciates where Walter's coming from, which just makes him even more creepy for us. And of course, Amy's the nurse, uh, and a creepy one too. Very happy to uh, uh, molest Sid there, uh, which is an instant way of showing that her fear of being touched doesn't really apply here. Nobody's powers work inside the illusionary world of the Shadow King. Um, so that kind of pushes it. And of course, because touch isn't her thing, how is, how is the Shadow King going to really mess with Sid? Just gropey touch and stuff. Um, and then the food and everything else. Uh, but I thought that Amy there played also a very important role because at the very end when she does have that scene with David, she lets slip about him being adopted. Uh, that they had to adopt him. Uh, and then as the Shadow King's talking to David later on, as Lenny's talking to David later on, he mentions that she knows his father uh, and that he tried to, he gave him away, tried to keep him away. So if we can connect these little points there, if we're thinking the Professor X type kind of thing, it would make sense. If he warred with the Shadow King, then he realizes he has a son, wants to get him far away from him as possible, so hopefully not subject him to this psychic parasite. Uh, that would sort of make sense. Now, is it a family member? Uh, is the dad's brother, sister's uh, brother, something like that, the father? We don't really know that. We don't really have any more information, but I do like the fact that they are playing with that and obviously there was a interaction between Shadow King and uh, David's father much like there was the battle between him and Professor X in the comics. 
I feel like I've been talking for quite a while here, so I'm going to try and wrap things up. Now, of course, next week, uh, Oliver has rescued people and Carrie has rescued people out of clockwork, so it's time to go in and try and really wrestle David free uh, from the grips of the Shadow King before he is lost forever. There's two episodes left. So much more to cover. Oh, I just, I can't wait till next week. I'm just chomping at the bit. So really, really excited. Um, now, I just want you guys to know, uh, next Tuesday, uh, I'm going to be hanging out with the crew down at Marvel Movie News. They record at 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time over on the Popcorn Talk Network. You can catch them up on YouTube.com uh, slash Popcorn Talk Network. Click on Marvel Movie News, and I'm going to be hanging on the couch uh, hanging with uh, Matt Coy and Marquia. So if you guys want to, go ahead and cruise by and check it out. It's always a fun time. And Iron Fist drops tomorrow. Uh, so we're going to talk Iron Fist there. That's going to be exciting. I'm not going to do a review, I don't think, for Iron Fist. I'm, I'm just, I'm too way over scheduled. Uh, but it'll be fun. I'll be able to get to hang with the guys and, and we'll talk some Iron Fist. So you guys can come and check that out. Uh, but if you did enjoy this particular review, go ahead and hit that like button. Thoughts, ideas, comments, throw those down in the comments section below. What did I miss? What didn't I cover that you wanted me to cover? And what big questions do you have about where we are and how we're going to get out of that? Any ideas? Uh, I love chatting with you guys. Throw those down in the comments section below. Now you can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Darren Jakes. You can check out anything I'm doing right there. Uh, other than that, don't miss any of these reviews. I know there's only two episodes left, and if you're not a subscriber, join us. We'll cover these episodes, and then we're diving right back into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, when it comes out in April. So you don't want to miss any of that, and you won't if you're a subscriber. And you can become one if you're not by just hitting my face right there. That works on your computer and your uh, mobile device, so that will work either way. And I will throw up our latest review for Black Sales right up here. So that's going to be it. I am D, and I'm out of here. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.